Um, all right, thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to have Siddharth Srinivasa here from who has recently moved as the Boeing Endowed Chair, uh, Professor in Robotics uh, to the School of Computer Science at UW from, uni from Carnegie Mellon University only a couple of months ago. So we are very happy to have him in this part of the country. Um, it will be, a, I'm not going to go through the list of his achievements because I need to give him time to talk. So, um, <clears throat> or I will just say that he, he started the personal robotics lab in CMU in 2005. He, and he has been very actively pursuing like, you know, rehabilitation robotics, assistive robotics, HRI, as well as fund foundational principles of planning, POMDP, search, um, and as well as building end-to-end -end systems like the CHIMP and the NSF and leading the NSF Colt Center at uh, CMU. Um, so I'll just let Sid talk for a minute. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm Sid. Thank you for, the, for inviting me here. Um, so this is, um, since there's not, not an, uh, you know, there's enough people for there to be a cozy discussion, please interrupt me anytime and ask questions. Uh, so I, um, as, as Dave was saying, um, I recently moved from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I was there for 18 years and, uh, and moved two and a half months ago. So uh, we're, we're here. Uh, and so please come by and visit our lab uh, at the University of Washington. I feel very lonely there. I don't know anybody, so it would be nice to have friends over. Um, I also I work on robotic manipulation, getting robots to pick stuff up and put them back down. Uh, it turns out that's a hard problem, uh, at least for me uh, and for some other people. So this is, uh, gives me a lot of job security. And, and today I'll give you um, sort of a, a whirlwind tour of some of the research that we've been doing, and I'll talk specifically about one component of it, which is endowing robots with simple models of physics such that they can perform uh, the kinds of manipulation tasks that we're used to performing, pushing, pulling, sliding, toppling, fearlessly reconfiguring anything that comes in the way of the task that we're trying to perform. So getting robots out of factory floors and into people's homes, hopefully. So I want to acknowledge my, my fantastic lab. One of my students, Gilwu, is here. Um, and uh, this is the, one of the last pictures we took before we left CMU. And uh, so there's a large gaping hole there, and, and everybody moved, uh, our robots and all of us. Uh, and uh, if there's one thing I do, it is manipulation, uh, robotic manipulation. My work is on getting robots to fearlessly interact with the world around them. Um, my focus personally is on uh, physics-based and model-based uh, manipulation and also in trying to get robots to do things that are sort of superhuman as well as uh, not familiar for robots to do. So robots are really, really good at factory floors. They build cars way better than we can. But if you look at our homes, then they're filled with clutter and uncertainty, uh, at least my home is. And so we're, what we're trying to do is endow robots with simple models of physics so that they can actually work effectively in our home environments. So uh, here's a, a video of, uh, of my robot in action. This is Herb. This is actually a, a, a commercial that we shot for Oreo. Uh, they called us uh, two weeks before this video was shot and said, can you get a robot, your robot, to separate the cookie from the cream? <laughs> Apparently a very, very hard and important problem in this country. Uh, and so we said, OK, we'll do this completely autonomously. Sure, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. And so we built. Uh, control motion planning algorithms to actually pull the Oreo apart. If any of you have used the wham arms before, you know how hard it is to actually get pull it out with the fingernails. These are sort of wobbly arms that are very, very hard to control. And, uh, and we did this all um, fully autonomously. Um, and this is certainly not a robot that we had ever built to uh, separate the cookie from the cream of an Oreo. If I, I would build a way better robot to do this, way less expensive robot. But it turned out that the Oreo was one of the most uh, delicate and smallest objects that we had ever manipulated. Uh, and we had never, like I said, never thought that we would ever get to manipulate such an object. And so it was a, somewhat of a, a testament to the algorithms that we had developed for motion planning, for control, for learning, for AI, uh, that we could actually scale up to this, this kind of system. Uh, so sort of truth in advertising, this only works fully about three out of ten times. So the Oreo problem is still wide open in case <laughs> Microsoft is interested in funding me to, to, to solve this problem. Uh, and, the, and the failures are delicious, really delicious. So it's a, it's a great problem to work on. So um, going back to a little bit of, the, of, of why I started working on this, this is a very 
pretty influential sort of evocative figure. This is when uh, you know Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. Uh, and, and this is great because this happened right when I was young and I, was, uh, I wanted to be uh, a computer scientist. I wanted to build computer programs that could you know, beat humans at, at, what, at rules that were generated by humans. Uh, and this is also particularly uh, interesting for me as a researcher because uh, here's this, this robot that is beating the best person in the world at a game that was designed by humans but yet, it needs a human to move its chess pieces. And so maybe, and this is a very, very biased view, the hardest part about playing chess is not thinking hundreds of moves ahead, but maybe it is actually picking up the chess pieces, which is, turns out to be exactly what I do. Um, but, Same with AlphaGo. Sorry? Same with AlphaGo. Same with AlphaGo, exactly. Who picks up the Go pieces, damn it? <laughs> Um, so I, I think this is sort of um, one of the themes of my research is to actually bring about a reconciliation between what robots are really good at, sort of planning and search in clean worlds where the rules are perfectly well specified to them in simulation, and what they ought to be really good at, which is dealing with the nitty gritty of physics and friction and Coulomb mechanics and contact and all of that. And a large part of my work is on trying to bring about these, these two fields together, such that we can actually prove interesting theoretical uh, properties of the algorithms that we're developing, but also show them working on real physical systems, because as roboticists, that's sort of what we ought to be doing. So I, I said I work on manipulation, but uh, over the past six or seven years, my work has also been focusing on manipulation with and around people. I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, but I thought I should at least briefly talk about it. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with human environments, then human environments have one thing in common, they have humans. Uh, and of course, robots could treat humans as obstacles that need to be avoided. But I would love to have robots and humans working seamlessly with each other. So here's a picture of my, my favorite chef. This is Jacques Pepin. Um, and every once in a while, he invites his, his daughter, who is uh, a, a novice chef, to come and cook with him on his TV show. And they have this wonderful interaction and wonderful dynamic. You know, she makes fun of him, he makes fun of her. But yet they're able to prepare a meal you know, seamlessly together, happily. And I'd love for this to be the case when I work with my robot. When my robot wheels into my kitchen uh, and wants to prepare a meal, I don't want to have to evacuate the kitchen because it's going to perform its sort of ninja maneuvers to, to cook a meal for me. I'd like to be able to cook a meal along with, the, with my robot in my kitchen. So there, just like we are, we're trying to resolve sort of search with, with, with real physical manipulation, my work has focused on trying to formalize some of the wonderful qualitative aspects of human-robot interaction in terms of trust or adaptation or seamlessness in terms of uh, optimal control, uh, treating humans as stochastic optimal controllers that have some latent state that they're noisily optimizing, and trying to endow robots with the ability to learn this uh, latent state, um, for, for example, via partially observable Markov decision processes, and to actually manipulate this latent state such that the robot can both understand what you want and manipulate you into working together and working seamlessly. So one example of this sort of manipulation is some work that we did on formalizing deception. So here we asked uh, our user to guess as quickly as possible which, uh, which bottle our robot was going after. And, and of course, the robot's goal was to deceive her. And how do we build this model? The robot had a Bayesian model of her interpretation of the robot's mo uh, motion, which we learned via inverse optimal control. And we simulated humans and how human decision making. And we knew that, and, and then we wrapped that into a trajectory optimizer such that the robot would actually maximize the discrepancy between its motion and what the user thought it was going to do. Right? So just in terms of writing out cost functions and optimizing it, we were able to at least render on the real world a concept that could be akin to deception. Right? So what is deception? It is. I'm going to try to tell you to go here, whereas I'm actually going here. You can formalize that mathematically in terms of you know, information gain, for example, or entropy. And you can produce robot behavior auto automatically that, for example, deceives you. Right? And this is really important because um, in the end, if you want a robot to be able to make decisions autonomously, 
then you need to endow it with algorithmic properties that can capture sort of the deep human insight that we have about each other. And this is one step towards doing that. So, so today I'm going to focus just on the top half of it. I could give an entire, entirely different talk on manipulating with and around people. But I'll focus on manipulation. And specifically today I'm going to talk about um, the flavor of manipulation that I've been working on over the past, oh no, it's been 18 years, um, which is physics-based manipulation, endowing robots with simple models of physics such that they can reason about the world. And, and a lot of this sort of... Uh, Oh, there's audio to this. I probably don't need that audio. Oh, right, right, right. But the robot is um, sliding this object close to itself and then grasping it. And if you notice this particular motion, what the robot did was that it, was, it realized that the block, that the object was not graspable. And so it used its entire arm to actually slide the object close to itself. This particular motion was completely hand-generated. We, we scripted this motion such that we said, if the robot can't see it, it should sweep its arm and get, it, get the object close to itself, such that it actually achieves two purposes. One is, of course, it brings the object closer to the camera that the robot has. The other is that it, it sort of settles the object in the, in, in the elbow and in the forearm such that it reduces the uncertainty of the object. And we realized that we were performing these sort of information gathering non-prehensile actions over and over again in a lot of our demonstrations. You do this all the time. You enter a room that is completely dark. You're trying to find the light switch. You sort of touch the wall, and then you slide your hand until you touch something else. So you're running a sequence of what are called guarded moves, such that you can actually localize uncertainty along various dimensions. And the question that we wanted to ask was, uh, can we actually understand this principle and, and, and automate it, enable robots to come up with such motions automatically. And, and the idea is that we want to be able to harness the mechanics of manipulation to funnel uncertainty. So this is a video where you see that so we have ground truth of the, uh, of the object that's being pushed into the hand. And you notice how here the uncertainty of the object starts off at, at, at this sort of big fuzzy mass that the robot doesn't know about. But just through the mechanics of interacting with it, it's able to funnel that uncertainty into a much, much, much smaller subset. Right? And, and this happens all the time when we curl our fingers around an object to pick it up. Of course, we're using our tactile sensing. But even if you were wearing gloves, you would be able to curl it in in such a way that you're using your actions to reduce uncertainty. And this principle is actually very powerful. And if you want to know the yes question, yes, please ask questions. What is, it, what is the prior knowledge that it has? I will tell you all about this in the next two and a half slides. But if you, if you don't know at that point, you can ask me again. Yeah. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Yes, um, reducing uncertainty. Right? So if you wanted to reduce the uncertainty of this bottle, of this, this hipster Zico uh, coconut water, then you could uh, you know, use tons of cameras and, and, and localize it. Or you could perform an action, which is putting it on the table. And if you knew the height of the table, then you know that the object is at a particular pose. So actions are as powerful at reducing uncertainty as our observations. Right? So to answer your question, um, how much should the robot know? Right? What should it know about the world such that it can actually make these decisions? Um, we actually wanted to endow our robot with a very, very simple model of physics. So the, the one thing you could do is like, push it through bullet or some other black box physics engine and simulate hundreds of thousands of these rollouts and try to see what the posterior belief would be. But instead, we decided that we try to come up with an analytical, simple model that we could actually roll out in order one. Right? And so this is actually a model uh, quite popular in physics called quasi-static pushing. Quasi-static pushing uh, is one of my favorite models. Uh, it actually works quite well for most things on tables. It says that the object that you're pushing stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it. So I'm going to push this object. And if it stops moving as soon as I stop pushing it, then it actually falls within the quasi-static regime. Several objects in your world, you can play it in front of you, will satisfy this quasi-static phenomenon. Several others won't. For example, if you have a ball that you're pushing, it's going to keep rolling as soon as you stop pushing it. So the universe of uh, explainable worlds, explainable interactions with quasi-static pushing is a decent set. But it's not the universal set, which makes sense, right? Because this is an order one rollout. 
you can't explain all of physics in order one. So it's, it, it, real physics is far more complicated. The nice thing about quasi-static pushing is exactly what I said. You have an analytical forward function that you can use. What you need to know is the geometry of the object and the velocity twist that you're pushing on the object. The nice thing about quasi-static pushing also is the fact that you don't have to deal with dynamics. Because the object stops moving as soon as you stop pushing it, it's going to stay there where, while you take your hand away and do other things. It's not going to roll off on its own. And you, don't, you, you can actually come up with fairly conservative estimates of pressure distributions and object friction coefficients and all of these things that are maddeningly hard to compute. Right? So with very, very conservative estimates, you can actually do pretty well. Once you're endowed with these estimates, or in some of our later work, you can learn these. So you can actually learn, do um, system ID on some of these physics parameters as you're interacting with them. This is actually very natural to us too, right? Because as we start interacting with objects, we suddenly realize that some of them are heavier or lighter or stickier or, or, or sort of you know, uh, slide more than other objects, right? And so our system does exactly that. Now, once you have this uh, physics model, which is an assumption that we're making about the universe. And you can either estimate or you can learn these physics parameters. You can actually compute what analytical capture regions. So these capture regions are, for example, for this two-dimensional uh, little bottle, every place that I can place the bottle such that after I enact a push, the object is going to curl into my hand and be graspable. Right? So it has this like funny sort of arrowhead kind of shape. Right? Now you can actually, and, and this can be computed analytically for a hand object pair. So it can be computed order one for any shape of the hand right? really, really quickly. Think of this capture region as a net. It's a net that you can throw on top of the object such that no matter where the object is in that net, you're guaranteed to capture it. Right? If you're trying to deal with it in beliefs, imagine that the object has some belief. And you're integrating that belief within this capture region. And you're computing the mass of that, of that belief in that region. And you say that has to be greater than some value that you want. So you can look at it either probabilistically or worst case. Right? Now, the cool thing here is that you can create these capture regions in SE2. This is x, y, and theta. This is a, a box that actually moves in x and y, but also spins. And this is the SE2 capture region of that. So as you're interacting with it, the object is spinning in this region. And you can guarantee that it's going to be in your hand. Right? And you can also can compute these analytically as you change the shape of the object. So looking at our net analogy again, sort of your vision system tells you that the object is here. You have some prior model, which tells you that really when my vision system tells me that the object is here, it's actually this, this sort of fog of uncertainty that it's spewing out about where the, where the object might actually be. Right? And what you're trying to do is to find the smallest net that you can throw on top of this uncertainty region such that it captures the uncertainty of the object. And once you have that, you can enact this open loop maneuver. Think of it as an open loop policy that you're enacting that is guaranteed to push the object into your hand. Right? And since you can do this order one with the quasi-static pushing assumption, you can actually just run this on, on robots. So this is a, a, a perception system here that's actually in the palm of the, of the hand. And the robot is actually enacting these uh, push, pushing maneuvers to actually both align the object as well as get it to a state where it can grasp it. So here's a case where it actually pushed it to the edge, edge of the table because it knew that at that particular pose it would be able to grasp it. Right? So question, yes? You said you want the smallest net. Why is that? Why do you think? Well, I, I guess you might have a risk of not, like if you're going too broad, but I still... So that's a question. Kind of Ima protect yourself. So. so imagine I have three objects on the table. And I need to pick up this object. If I, if I broaden my net really widely, I may not only pick up this object, but I may also pick up this other guy. Right? So a net is exactly, you know, if you're a fisherman and you just want to catch fish, you should just toss the net, you know, a large net entirely on the table. But if you're trying to target one particular object, right, you are trying to deal with producing a net that's as large as possible to capture the object while not accidentally capturing something else. Right? 
because these object-object interactions, as you, as you broaden your net, the object-object interaction might actually cause one of the objects to like, push out of it. This is actually, I'll talk about the limitation of my work. This is actually a limitation that I'll address in, in two slides. There's a slide, there's a picture of my robot with a knife. I don't know why, but th there it is, yes. Um, so uh, that was nice, but this, is, this was something that we were really proud of. This sound again, which makes me nervous. Uh, so this is um, the, uh, if, if any of you know about the DARPA Wait, ARM program, this is the infamous lug nut from the DARPA ARM program that no one was able to pick up. DARPA gave us several millions of dollars such that we would change a tire of a, a vehicle. Little did they realize that the robot that they gave us, the WAM arm, could not actually pick up the lug nuts that we had to use. Of course, that was like an incidental detail for DARPA. Uh, and it turned out that you know, we had enacted a whole bunch of like, handcrafted strategies to try and pick up this damn lug nut, and we had failed. And so we tossed it to this problem to our, our algorithm. It said, figure out the pre-shape of the hand such that you would actually be able to pick up the lug nut given some uncertainty of it. And it actually came up with a strategy, and it came up with this strategy uh, that actually worked. So this is one of the few cases where a robot actually comes up with something that's like way better than an expert human. But what it's doing is that it's pre-shaping its fingers in such a way that it creates this little funnel, and it's using that funnel to sort of scrape all the uncertainty and, and funnel it into the tip of the fingers, and then it can actually grab it. So this is kind of cool because we, our, our robot was able to come up with an algorithm that uh, you know, we ourselves had, had a hard time figuring out. So were you doing all these kind of simulation with different pre shapes? Yes. So, so the, the advantage of the, of, the, of the order one simulation is that for, arbit for any pre shape that you have and any object, you can in order one come up with the capture region, right? So Yes. You mentioned earlier that uh, you're working on like for accessibility type scenarios. Do you have any like blind researchers or anything like that on your team? Because it seems like many of the strategies you're describing would be ones that would be utilized with people with have vision issues, for example. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that um, a lot of the so I, I won't talk about some of the work that we do with some modular optimization, but uh, a lot of those that work is is like directly related to how you sort of lo localize yourself in the dark, for example. One, cap, one, one like small word of concern is that um, it's often very, very hard to retarget anthropomorphic strategies to non-anthropomorphic systems. Um, so um, oftentimes, of course, this kind of, you know, we also tend to anthropomorphize everything. So you think, oh, this is how I might do it if I couldn't see in the dark. I'd sort of, no, you wouldn't. You would do it in like a way better way, <laughs> likely, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think like, Thinking of yourself as a three-fingered hand that can sort of wobblyly move along the table, you know, is, is often challenging. But the retargeting problem, I, I think the retargeting has a lot of inspirations. Like this is how we started working on push grasping because we were like, hey, this is how I pick up my coffee mug. I sort of slide it into my hand. But sometimes the actually one of the reasons why we were we had a hard time coming up with strategies ourselves as experts for the system was that we were trying very anthropomorphic strategies. We were like, hey, let's try to scrape it in. Whereas the robot actually came up with a strategy that was sort of not incredibly anthropomorphic. So um, speaking about the, so this is great. It worked really well. Uh, my student, uh, Mehmet, got his PhD. But uh, I should talk about the limitations of this work too. So this actually ended up, being a, a large area of research that a lot of people started working on, this idea of sort of non-prehensile manipulation. Uh, there was work on pushing, there was work on soccer robots that were trying to kick things from place to place. Uh, there was our own work, there's also work that was trying to incorporate that into a multi-object manipulation scenario, so this ended up being a, a mini industry on its own. Uh, limitations, so one limitation is that we've only modeled single object interaction. I told you that I can analytically compute this capture region when one object interacts with one hand, right? What happens when there are two objects? Everything blows up, at least analytically, right? Because the multi-body contact mechanics is not something that you can solve in order one, right? Um, so this is a limitation. Um, the other is that the contact is limited to the end effector, right? I want my robot to be able to use its entire arm, its whole body, to be able to manipulate stuff, but in the demonstrations that I've shown you, uh, the contact was actually limited just to the end effector itself. 
And in some ways, I would say, critiquing myself, that these are sort of carefully coded motion primitives, right? We told the robot, hey, you should move straight. We gave the robot a lot of freedom to, to twirl its fingers however it wished, but fundamentally we said, hey, there's the object. You should just probably move straight. And that was sort of, in, in my critical eye, was carefully coded, right? What I'd like to be able to do is to give the robot a bunch of objects and say, that, those are the objects. I'm not going to tell you anything more. Wave your arms around however you wish. Use your entire body. Use as many object interactions as you wish and solve the problem for me. And that's what we did. Uh, so here's, uh, hopefully this video will play. It's a nice video. I'll make it play. Let's see. What if I do this? Yes, yeah. yeah, excellent. So um, here the robot is told that it needs to move this goal object into its target. And it doesn't care about where any of the other objects are. And that's it. And so the robot, for example, here decides that it's going to cradle the object in its sort of forearm and push it along the way while simultaneously pushing all of these other objects out of the way. So you see that there's multi-object contact happening, there's whole arm manipulation happening. The robot is sort of figuring it out all by itself. Right? Um, and so it is using physics. It is fearlessly reconfiguring whatever else that it sees along its way. But it's able to do that. Uh, with just a simple model of physics that I talked about before, but by opening it up to its entire arm. Right? So the, the ne next 15 slides or so, I'll tell you how we actually end up doing this. But this is cool because this allows a robot to, to use its entire body, to use all of the objects, to move whatever it wants out of its way such that it can actually solve the problem. So uh, let me formalize this a little bit more. So we, we call this problem the rearrangement planning problem. And in the rearrangement planning problem, you have a robot. It's the thing that moves stuff. You have a bunch of obstacles. These are immovable things that you can't touch, like walls or tables. And you have a bunch of movable objects. These are objects that uh, the robot can move. Right? They're not going to move on their own, but the robot can potentially move them. And your goal is to push an object into a goal region. So you want to push this green block into the goal region. So notice that uh, the goal can be underspecified, which means that you care about the green object being in, the, in that region, but you don't care about where any of the other stuff is. Right? So that's, an, that's a, a, a feature that you can potentially exploit. Or it could be fully specified. You could say, I want this object here, this object here, this other object here. It's, it's whatever you wish. Right? So we work with this uh, cross product state space, which is the cross product. Yes, question. In your problem statement, do you know the objects? Or is the robot familiar with the objects? Uh, yes, in this uh, particular uh, version of the statement, I'll relax that several slides down. Uh, you know the geometry of the objects. So you're playing the same game that you played before. You know the geometry of the objects, and you know the starting pose of the object. objects. Right? So you're, you're given the state of the world. Uh, you're trying to solve the sort of reinforcement learning problem of like actually pushing them to their destinations. You also know the you assume that you know some quasi-static mechanics. Okay. We'll relax all those assumptions soon. So you're working in this cross-product state space of the robot and all possible movable objects. So this is a fairly large cross-product space. Uh, here you have the robot, you have your movable objects, you have some action space. Let's say it's the set of like, joint velocities that you can give to your robot, so how you wave, wave your arms around. Uh, so it could be some low-level control that you apply for some duration, whatever you wish. And then uh, here's the kicker is that you have physics constraints. And these can be fairly nonlinear, non-contact, non-prehensile interaction. Right? So it's, it's however the world moves when you tell it to move. Um, we're going to look, look at this through the lens of quasi-static physics. But the physics interactions can be, can be fairly complicated. Right? And of course, the, the first challenge we faced was how do we incorporate the sort of whole arm, non prehensile interaction with multiple objects? Like this, is a, this is not an easy problem. Right? And we decided that we would uh, sort of integrate physics models, the, the same physics models that I talked about before, into the core of randomized planners. Randomized planners are nice in some ways because they're able to trade off optimality for speed. Right? These planners, you can consider them to be anytime algorithms, which means that any time I ask you for an answer, you're able to give me an answer. And if I give you more time, you're able to find a better answer. Right? Randomized planners 
Um, also, sort of exploit randomization, which can be nice in a very, very high dimensional space. Right? So if you were trying to do an organized search in a high dimensional space, that could cost you some effort. Instead, randomized planners exploit randomization to do that. So, uh, so an example would be a rapidly exploring random tree or Monte Carlo tree search, which is what many of you might be familiar with. So let's look at one such tree search. Uh, the way these algorithms work is that you, you're growing a tree in, some, in your whatever abstract space that you're in, um, where each configuration is some full state of the entire system. This is the object, the robot, and everything else. Um, you sample a point, uh, and, and of course, each action, each edge is an action. It's a rollout of your physics. Right? You uh, sample a point in space. So think of your tree search as a tree that's growing, and you sample a distant star, and you want to move towards it. Right? So this is a sample point. You compute its nearest neighbor. Of course, there's lots of research that we had to do about figuring out nearest neighbors in these non-Euclidean spaces. Obviously, you have this cross-product space of robot joints and object poses. That's like a fairly complicated space. So one thing you can do is actually do some metric learning and, and learn good nearest neighbors and distance metrics such that these algorithms are actually successful, which is what we did. But at the general level, you'd like to be able to go here. right? Now, if you're moving in straight lines, the answer is easy. I just connect the start and the goal by a straight line. But you're not. You're beholden to this like, crazy, complicated, non-prehensile interaction to actually get there. So how do you actually, so this is called a two-point boundary value problem. You have two points, and they're at the boundaries, and you'd like to connect them. And we end up solving them actually using a nonlinear non optimization technique. And we actually use a very, very simple one in this case, which is uh, a shooting method. Shooting methods are really, really, so you'd like to go there. Uh, shooting methods are actually really simple. You sample your action space, and then you just roll out trajectories from your action space, and you see where they land. And you pick the one that comes closest to your destination. Right? And of course, you can use more complicated methods. You could use CMA, for example. And then you just go there. Right? The, the, you actually never ended up at your target, but you ended up close enough to your target that you're like, eh, that's fine. And you're using the power of randomization to actually explore the space further. So you're just sort of rapidly exploring out. Um, this is actually, as a sort of minor sidebar, this is where tree-based methods are really, really useful. If you had a graph-based method where you had actual connections that had to be closed, then you're beholden to actually make those connections. Like if you and I have to meet at two points, we have to, by definition, solve the two-point boundary value problem. But if you have a tree-based method, there are no loops, there are no connections made, so you can just sort of grow your tree as you wish. Right? So that's one advantage of sort of Monte Carlo tree search-like methods. And then you keep doing this until you reach your goal. And then once you reach your goal, you can actually you have the, the solution uh, to, your, to your target, where the robot moves and gets itself to the goal. So there the robot is just following its back pointers and enacting that strategy. Of course, you notice here immediately, this is by no way an optimal plan. right? And this is deliberately so. I just, I just pushed out the first trajectory that it returned. If you give it more time, you can branch and bound this tree and produce more and more sort of better solutions. Right? And so that, that was nice. We were able to actually incorporate the, the entire ARM non-prehensile interaction with multiple objects. There's sort of five years of work that I'm like, hiding underneath here about the nitty gritty of actually making this work. But that's the sort of general idea. Right? You're running this sort of Monte Carlo tree search in a, in a large high dimensional space. Uh, even this is often insufficient uh, to solve problems in sort of very, very large uh, state spaces. Uh, and one of the, so the, the, the second big challenge is sort of how do you make it sort of real time? Right? Obviously, I don't want a robot that takes 20 minutes staring at a table before it figures out how to like, move it. Like, the physical worlds move much, much faster than that. And I'm not planning in simulation. I'm actually planning like, in, a, in a world where you know, other people are doing other things. So um, one of the, the, the interesting things that we decided to do was to actually project actions onto a lower dimensional physics manifold. What does this mean? I told you that I love um, quasi-static pushing. Quasi-static pushing basically says that if you are on a table, like, you, you're golden, right? You, you can push this object around, and it's going to stay as is. Quasi-static pushing is a terrible assumption to like, track the flight of this object. Because this object, as it's flying in the air, is definitely moving when I stop actually interacting with it. Right? And so we decided that, well, we'll restrict the state space that our planner explores 
only to regions where quasi-static pushing is valid. This is a pretty big assumption we're making, right? We're basically saying no throwing, right? Uh, I see a scene, it's full of clutter. Uh, boy, I wish I could just throw it, toss it up in the air, do a bunch of operations, grab it, and drop it back down. That would be cool, but I'm not going to do that, right? And so by restricting ourselves to be in the plane, so right here, basically, every action that the robot takes is projected onto the physics manifold where quasi-static pushing is valid, right? And that's a, a deliberate choice that we made because we said, hey, I can run quasi-static pushing in order one, so I'm going to restrict myself to that domain. What's the major disadvantage of that? If I could actually pick up the object, toss it up in the air, and do a bunch of things, my robot won't tell you that. It just won't. Right? So it's, uh, we're, we're giving up potential expressiveness of our algorithm, of the solutions, for speed. Right? This is a very, very deliberate decision that we made. Right? Ten years from now, when everything is 5,000 times faster, we can relax this assumption and just run the Monte Carlo research on you know, whatever you know, the next best uh, physics simulator that you have, and it will work perfectly well. But for now, right now, this is the assumption that, that we're making. Right? And so when you do that, you're actually able to get some really, really expressive motion. So this is, this is the entire algorithm in action. It's able to reason about the interactions between various objects, various parts of its body, and various aspects, while still maintaining the quasi-static assumption. Notice here that every interaction that it has with the object, it's trying to interact with it in such a way that it doesn't sort of topple it or push it in a way that, that breaks the quasi-static assumption. So it's able to enact that. Um, and so this, this is kind of nice because you know, I can play several videos of it. This is a, a, another video that we shot right before some Amazon executives came uh, with Amazon boxes. Uh, and one of the nice things about um, quasi-static pushing is that it allows you to move things that you can't pick up. Like if you have an object that's really, really large that you can't pick up, you can actually push it or move it or pull it or slide it out of the way such that you can actually interact with it. Uh, so we took this idea one step further. So this is the Mars rover, um, and this is the K-10 rover. Uh, and we uh, collaborated with NASA, who came to us and said that they were interested in getting the Mars rover to push rocks or terrain, or reconfigure terrain on Mars. Only problem is the Mars rover doesn't have any arms on it. Uh, you know, it's very high payload, and they want to be able to push stuff. And we said, well, we could try using our algorithm and see how it would do in such a setting. So we created a setting, this is uh, at NASA, uh, where we endowed our robot with a quasi-static pushing model. And here's the robot actually pushing boxes around using its body. So this is the exact same algorithm that ran with the manipulator arm. And of course, as humans, we tend to anthropomorphize this all the time. We're like, hey, it sort of got this object into its little, little like hand-like appendage and pushed it. But the robot doesn't know anything like that, right? It just has the, the raw geometry of the, of, the, of the object, and it's using that raw geometry to interact with it, right? So this is, this is kind of cool because, again, we, we never intended our algorithm to be used for this purpose, and we were able to sort of get it working pretty fast. Question, yes? So the field looks a lot smoother than Mars, and I wonder but if But that's not Mars, yes. <laughs> uh, and I wonder if your algorithms account for the structure of the, the surface that it's on as well? That's a great question, yeah. I think that, um, so even here, right? Uh, let me play this video again. Um, this, even this field, even though this is kind of smooth, is not as smooth as a table. Right? The table is sort of, you know, you can really bound the coefficient of friction of the interaction between the table and, and any coffee mug that you have. And so um, the, the way we were actually able to run this algorithm was using something that I'll show in the next slide. Uh, one of the things that we do is very similar to domain randomization. So essentially, you assume that you have a range of physics that you need to be robust to, because you don't assume that there's just one uh, friction coefficient. You assume that there's sort of a range of friction coefficients, and you produce policies, open loop policies that are robust to that. That said, your question is totally valid. If there were rocks everywhere, then that's, that's actually not quasi-static, right? So it would be like saying, if I put a bunch of pile of objects on this table and started pushing things around, that is like definitionally not quasi-static. Our algorithm would produce a quasi-static solution, but it's just not going to work, right? It's not going to be physically realistic, right? Because it's sort of, we can only be as expressive as our algorithm is able to, able to produce, right? 
our algorithm will actually say, if I throw this up in the air, our algorithm will say it's going like, to be frozen in space, which is you know, absolutely not valid. Right? Yeah. So um, talking about actually your point, which is that you know, I talked about this sort of beautiful worlds where all the coefficients of friction and everything pose is known. But really what the world looks like is this. right? Um, you don't exactly know the pose of your object. You don't exactly know the coefficient of friction between the object and the table. And you'd like to sort of, as much, as, as much system ID as you do, you're still going to have some model of, some amount of uncertainty, which you can potentially model. And so you can ask a, a, a very similar question, which is how can you push the object to the goal region with high probability? So instead of, turn, instead of having a deterministic problem, you turn it into a belief space problem, right? So one of the things that we did was actually come up with a, a definition of path divergence. So path divergence essentially asks the question, if I start as a tight ball and I enact a particular action, how tight is my ball going to be at the end of that action? Is it going to break up into two balls? Is it going to turn into a slightly fatter ball? Obviously, if it stayed as a tight ball, then that particular path is fairly robust, has low divergence. right? So here's an example of actually six different trajectories or of, the, of the same robot action overlaid on top of each other. And you can see how this particular action is not very, very robust at all to uncertainty. It actually broke the, the object into two clusters, essentially. Right? And our algorithm was able to, we were able to show, and this algorithm is based on some nonlinear control theory, that such an action would have high divergence. Obviously, we were able to do this even without enacting this action. That's the game you're trying to play, is trying to predict whether a particular action will have high or low divergence. Here's another action. Come on, action. Oh, there you go. That um, has low divergence. And so we were able to predict that this action has low divergence, and it actually does. Right? So um, one of the nice things about this, this prediction metric is that before you enact an action, before you expensively roll it out and enact it, you can actually come up with a, uh, an estimate of its divergence. You don't even have to run rollouts. So the trivial way to do this would be in simulation to run a bunch of rollouts, collect data, and look at, the, for example, the variance of the data. We're able to do that using just an order one analysis of the, of the initial conditions of the system. So when you have systems with sort of low and high divergence, you can actually come up with an algorithm, for example, that says, in my old Monte Carlo research, I am going to not have actions that increase my divergence. I'm only going to produce actions that decrease my divergence. While this works pretty well, this is sort of overly conservative sometimes, right? So sometimes you need to break things before you can sort of unbreak them. So if you track the pose of this particular object, the divergence is actually increasing. Right? It's you're actually increasing the places that you don't know where this plate is as you push the object, but you don't care as long as it's not in the exact places that you want it to be in. And our path divergence algorithm would not be able to produce such, such actions right? because it's sort of overly conservative. So it turns out that you can actually formulate this as an unobservable Monte Carlo planning problem, and you can actually solve it fairly efficiently. I don't have time to talk about that, but the algorithm itself reasons exactly like the question that you're asking. We're reasoning over the possible belief space representations of uncertainty of state, of pose, of physics parameters, and you're able to produce open loop stable actions that are actually, with high probability, going to give you uh, a solution that works. Again, keep in mind that this is all fully open loop, right? So the robot looks at the world, closes its eyes, and moves objects around. So this is nice because, and of course, you can run this forever. It's pretty neat. Um, one of the, the, of course, this is all completely open loop. And so one question you can ask is, well, why don't you close the loop on that? Well, if you have some tactile sensing, for example, can you actually incorporate tactile sensing into it? And the answer turns out to be yes. It's not easy, but, um, but we could do it. So here's an example of some work that we've done on what are called manifold particle filters. This is essentially generalizing um, sequential importance resampling algorithms for tracking the posterior belief to um, contact manifolds, which allows you to take something that has a sort of fog of uncertainty and bring it down to a much smaller set based on not just the physics that you're rolling out, but also the contacts that are feeling in your hand. So this is like you're groping inside a, a cupboard for something that you want. You're feeling sensations of the object. And as you're feeling the sensations, you're trying to localize the object. You can generalize that even further to what are called contact POMDPs. 
So this is actually actively taking action. So it's sort of feeling the object with its fingers such that it can actually pick it up, sort of closing the loop on that. So are you using the, the camera merely for ground truth in these experiments? Yes, in this particular experiment, uh, the camera is used actually just to get an initial uncertain pose estimate. Um, the reason for that is sort of multifold. Uh, one is uh, we wanted to isolate the effects of tactile sensing. So we wanted to look specifically at a problem where you have just tactile sensing available to you. The second is that in a lot of the situations that we work in, we're either sort of rummaging inside stuff or your end effector occludes your object. So this is the, like the biggest challenge in robotic manipulation is that uh, the thing that you want to pick up is often occluded by the thing that's picking it up. Right? So you want to pick up the coffee mug. You're like, yay, I can see the coffee mug. And then as soon as your end effector gets over it, you're like, oh, I can't see the coffee mug anymore. So it's one of those challenges where the, the right when you need to pick up the object that you want to pick up, it's going to be occluded by you know, by your hand. So when you're thinking about divergence, is that, uh, is that typically in the case where you're not using the, the, the camera? Yes. OK. It's exclusively in that case. And so those, those initial um, uncertain regions or positions and orientations, that's, that's just from the fact that you have a noisy image sensor, and that's only in the initial conditions. Exactly, yeah. But there's nothing that prevents you from incorporating a posterior observation model of, a, of an imaging yeah, sensor, absolutely. too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we're not, we're not doing that in this case, very deliberately. So let me show you a case where we're actually using the perception data. So this is um, all of the algorithms that I talked about like, actually working in a real system. This is the DARPA robotics challenge um, where, uh, so this is all running in real time. There's no cut time. So we're using our the human is actually providing breadcrumbs here. So there's an expert operator who's providing breadcrumbs of where they wish the hand to be, because we're using the human as a sort of guide for, for planning. And then they just click a button, and the robot plans uh, a, a motion using the same algorithms that I talked about to actually pick up that object. And then here the human is saying, well, I want you to turn something like this. And they click a button, and the robot is able to produce those motions. The human verifies that. And once the human verifies that, it runs in this sort of high-profile, high-pressure competition and hopefully works. And so this is the planning algorithms in action. And then in a second, it'll actually run them on the real robot using um, tactile sensing that is in this hand to actually close the loop on, um, you know, on all of this. Right? So it's using a hybrid force position controller. So this is, um, so this is the in the DARPA robotics challenge. On the first day of the competition, uh, we had two points. And we were at, at the bottom. And then the, hopefully on the, on the second day, well, we won 16 more points because we had all the manipulation challenges and we did all right. So it was a particularly uh, terrifying two days. But, but uh, it, was a, it was a cool robot. So I want to talk a little bit about manipulating with and around people. I, I, I promised you that I'll tell you a little bit about it. So that's the sort of wrap up of the previous uh, section. I'll spend about three or four slides on this. Specifically, I'm actually uh, very interested in, oh, too much sound. Yes. Um, actually, a thought, like, you know, so, in, so if I were to, like, show you, like, you know, information gathering behavior, mm -hmm. like, you know, when I, like, you know, you, you put your hand inside the cupboard, you make your first or second contact points. If you were shown that, like, if you see this, right, like, you know, the most informative action you get is by taking this other action after this. Mm -hmm. Right, like you know, uh, but obviously that's a data-driven method, yeah. right? Like you know, and this is coming from a, a expert op demonstrator. Expert demonstrator, okay. right? Like you know, let's say you're, like you, you have a human who also does the same thing, and imagine for a second that you were able to like track, do motion capture inside the cupboard. You you can't really, but like imagine you can track full state, and you made the human also have the same like you know, um, like not be able to look inside the cupboard. The human, yep. anyways. So and and basically the same and um, and and be able to like touch only with the fingers and whatnot and and hunt for information, mm -hmm. right? And assuming that the human is much better because the human is like bringing very rich physics models and all of neuroscience and uh -huh. evolution is 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 very good at hunting, mm -hmm. right? So do you think that value of hunting, like showing how to hunt, is can be useful in maintaining like you know like how to expand the tree? 
Uh, that's a great question. So essentially, if I, if I have some prior idea of information gathering actions, can I actually incorporate that into my, um, you know, into my PalmDP, into my Monte Carlo tree search? Yeah, um, I, think, I think the answer is yes. Um, I think that, um, actually, it's interesting because these information gathering actions are often the hardest to find, right? If you run a, like a QMDP hindsight optimization, they often give up on information gathering actions for solving the problem. They say that, you know, I'm just going to forget about information gathering actions because they're really, really hard to compute. Um, I wonder, so, you know, the sort of naive hacky way, I would say, uh, would be to say, well, you employ your information gathering action and then reduce your uncertainty to something manageable, at which time you bring it to within the, the, the pre-image of an open loop action that you can enact. Right? So you say, I'm going to take all these information gathering actions. Oh, now I can just push the object into my hand. Right. But whether there's a formal way to actually sort of get that kind of behavior, that would be interesting. Right. Um, so because like with Sanjeevan's work, one of the things we, we, we noticed was the same thing as we're noticing with QMDP kind of thing, is we couldn't show, get it to get to solve the problems where like, you know, that there's this like, like, you know, like the canonical PalmDP problem, go switch, flick on the light bulb mm -hmm. and then just go to the goal because now you can see everything. Right, the QMDP would never do that. We'll, we'll never do that because like it has full state during like, exactly. the yep. simulation, so it just goes for the goal, right? So, um, and it's, it's just kind of a hard thing to, to show. Right, like you know, to incorporate, right? So yeah, I, th I think the uh, I, I think one of the the interesting bits about humans is how good we are at these information seeking actions, sort of intuitively. Right. Uh, in many ways, I think we tend to so PomDP, right, will like optimally trade off um, exploration versus exploitation. Right, you'll be like, I'm just going to learn just enough about this room such that I can pick up the coffee mug. Whereas here's my like wild generalization of humans. I think that we as humans like do this in two stages. We like reduce uncertainty until we can like see what's going on and then we just plan to the target, right? So I think we, we sort of almost stage it as, let me know everything, let, I, I can't see the lights, let me like go turn on some lights, figure out where I am, and then let me solve the problem, which may be inefficient in a Bayesian sense, but I think it just allows us to better resolve our, our planning horizon, right? And, uh, and I think that's a very interesting so modality to use. What if you likewise decompose it into two different problems where you highly reward information gathering regardless of the actual task that you're doing. Mm -hmm. You waste a little bit of your effort in doing that mm -hmm. such that... But I, I think that... Yeah. The question is, like, can, we, uh, can that behavior emerge out of the, like, the cost structure? Like, can, can, you, can you construct a problem such that mm -hmm. this sort of information gathering just emerges out of, mm -hmm. out of just the mechanics of solving the PomDP? Um, and, and yeah, I think I think it's interesting, um, and and I think so it's also if you get the right cost. Then the expert knowledge can definitely help in guiding the search, right? Right, right. I mean, in some sense, it's like a like cost function shaping problem, but it turns out to be like very hard. Like you know, we thought hard, at least for two months, we thought greatly about it, <laughs> and we, we didn't find a very easy way of incorporating both like you know data driven public solution and the fact that you should show information gathering. Right. That's very interesting. I think also, so one more statement about the, that and then I'll, I'll continue. Um, uh, so you can formalize um, info gain, right? So you can look at it purely from an information gathering point of view, right? You can say, I wanna maximize the information I'm gaining about the system. I have a set of actions that I can, I can perform. Uh, you can potentially prove that part of it, parts of it might be submodular. Uh, but that again is like purely info gain, right? Like it has no, no concept of reward, right? Like any of these information gathering algorithms are just trying to reduce the information. Right? Yeah, you're rewarding information, exactly. So I guess there's some, there may be some switch that you can, you can, you can turn, or maybe some trade-off between these purely info gathering actions versus sort of reward, reward biasing actions. That's that's kind of a, an interesting idea. I guess you're saying that if you structure the problem that way, wonder. Yeah, I, yeah, I should think I, more about it. My, my limitation is that I don't know how to do that. <laughs> It's, 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 uh, Without just sort of deliberately saying that there's two stages, like stage A, reduce, in, uh, reduce uncertainty, stage B, exploit. exploit. One last question though. If you have these expert actions, can you use that to cost, shape your cost and reward such that that is your information gathering? Yes, uh, we, we can. But the problem is how do you get the expert to show to do information gathering as a natural part of solving the problem? Right? Because like, you know, the, the, 
the cost function usually says like you get rewards for reaching the goal, right, or, or solving the task, right, um, and it's it's hard to incorporate, to make to suffer a cost to gather information. It's also like tied to the sparse rewards problem, right? Like you know. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a good yeah. We should talk about this more. Yeah. Do it while looking good. Sorry. Do it while looking good. Solve the problem part of your objective function. <laughs> Do it while looking good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> so caregiving systems. Uh, essentially, I've been working with um, this company, Canova, that builds robot arms uh, that are mounted on powered wheelchairs. I know some of you, are, I think you have some of these arms here. Uh, I actually work very closely with Canova. I'm helping them design their next generation robot arms. But I'm particularly excited about enabling people. Uh, especially uh, people with high spinal cord injuries. We work with paraplegics, quadriplegics, as well as um, kids uh, and older adults to use robot arms that are mounted on powered wheelchairs um, to perform complex manipulation tasks, like pull out a meal from a fridge, microwave it, and eat from it, using very, very, very simple interfaces. Could be a head mounted joystick, could be sip and puff, um, could be BCI. So we've done some work with Andy Schwartz, where we're, uh, we have uh, cortical implants that are uh, implanted into your skull, and we're reading sort of individual motor neuron firings using machine learning algorithms to decode them and then closing the loop on control. Uh, so this, this problem is particularly interesting because everything that I've talked to you about now is focused mostly on autonomy, but really it is one of shared autonomy. Um, so sort of an interesting, con this is Seb, this is someone we actually work with. Uh, when I first talked to Seb, I said, well, we'll just make your arm autonomous. Problem solved as a roboticist. And he actually had a very interesting point to make. He said that this robot arm is one of the few things in my life that I can actually control. And I don't want to lose control of that too. I don't want it also to be doing things for me. So I think this notion of shared autonomy is not only practical as a robotic system, because obviously the robot doesn't know everything. So you incorporating the human is useful. But also important from a sort of acceptance and, and human design point of view is that the people who are using these arms may not want it to be completely autonomous all the time. They may actually want some control over, over what, it, what it does and how it behaves. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of videos of, of some of this work. We have a, a, sort of a lot of papers on this, on shared autonomy, on actually formalizing this concept of shared autonomy. This is actually uh, one of the uh, videos with Jan, who's one of the patients that we have with um, a cortical implant. So here we're using BCI to move the 60 degree of freedom robot arm, but actually the robot is not learning how to move the arm, but is actually learning what her intentions are from this arm. So learning intentions is actually a much more lower dimensional problem than learning mapping directly from, from, from what you're thinking to motions. And if you can actually learn intentions, then the robot can map those intentions to actual action. So what we're running is we have a uh, a Bayesian framework of how the human's motor neurons are firing with respect to the goals that they want. We're updating the posterior belief of what their targets might be based on this framework. And we're using that posterior belief to actually uh, control the robot. So the robot has a belief over what you might want to do, and it's acting in such a way that it maximizes under expectation your posterior belief. This actually turns out to be, so this is, you can see the beliefs changing here. Just now, now it's locked in, it's gone to zero to 100%. And this actually is a kind of a, a key insight of our work is just the idea that instead of directly trying to map what you're thinking to your control actions, which is actually a really hard problem, like it's, it's, it's maddeningly hard. If you map it to what your intentions are, which is a really, really low dimensional space, you can actually make, make headway on this problem, right? Of course, this crucially requires an intelligent robot, right? It requires a robot that's not just a puppet and you're just learning the strings that control the puppet. You're, you're mapping it to a robot and you're telling it intentions because you know that once, it, once you tell the puppet how to dance, it's going to be able to dance by itself, right? Yes? So uh, problems similar to this uh, are ones that, that our team has talked about a bit. So in the case of a uh, ADA access button, can that be mapped as a quasi-static object because it only moves in like one dimension or because it pops back? Is that not the case? Um, I mean, it's a, they mean the physics, physical interaction of it. Yeah. I could probably model it as a like lump parameter spring damper system. But yes, okay, it, so, it's modelable. Yeah. So in, in our particular case, we work a lot with people with ALS, and so that that discussion of autonomy versus individual control is yes. is very current because uh, we have limited access to uh, manipulation from uh, the user. 
So the idea of like mounting a Canova arm on a wheelchair and being able to say have the arm uh, semi-autonomously push the ADA access button, mm -hmm. it, how far away is the quasi-static solving system that you have uh, from doing that and what kind of additional stuff beyond the robotic arm do I have to have LiDAR on the wheelchair to do that? Do I have to have you know, connects or other you know, Orbex sensors? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, so we can do that. Uh, we've actually done this with Kinova. Actually, Seb has ALS, um, okay. well, our, our, the, the patient that we work with. Sure. Uh, he, he's also a Kinova, former Kinova employee. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, he's an expert user. And he, when he, when he was, was happy with the, with, with the semi-autonomy that we provided. Um, we need uh, some form of perception, right? Uh, whatever that might be. So it could just be an RGB camera that's on the wheelchair. So wheelchair is really beautiful as a test platform because it's got power, it's got compute, you can stick a computer in it. It's not like a human or a drone. Yeah, that the compute was my next question, is, is how, how big of a computer that? So we actually have. just use the, the, the same computer that comes with the, the Jaco or the Miko arm. So we're not using any excessive computing. Um, you brought up several interesting points, right? One is, um, so there's a lot of, so I, I, I gave you the sort of, yes, we can guess intentions. Yes, yes, sure. But really, there's also a lot of like signal, uh, signal to noise compression that we need to do because, for example, with an ALS patient, they're producing very, very noisy data, um, as was Seb, and so we had to do some filtering on that. The other, but we can do it, right? We actually use an RGBD sensor um, that's actually mounted on the hand itself. So we're using a structure I/O camera. It's an off-the-shelf camera that you can use. Uh, we're mounting it, it's an eye in hand system, so we're mounting it right at the wrist. Happy to actually share that with you. It's kind of cool because you can sort of move your hand around. We've done a bunch of work on like mapping three-dimensional spaces using very, very simple low-cost sensing. It's an algorithm called Chisel that we developed. Um, but yeah, so the robot sort of scans the scene with its hand and then is able to get RGBD data out of it and then uses that to build a model of the world and then uses that model to plan in the world. Um, the other point that you raise is actually really, 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 really valid. So we use, um, uh, and this is a limitation of my work. Um, so we use inverse optimal control to actually come up with this model of predicting what the user's intentions are. Right? We can't, we can't learn that by magic. Right? So the way we do that is that we get an able-bodied user to come and be like, hey, uh, pick up the coffee mug. Now pick up this coffee mug here. Pick up this other coffee mug here. And we get lots and lots and lots of data of people reaching to pick up stuff, either with this arm or with their own hands. And then we use that to build a model of how humans reach. We invert the model to guess their intentions. There's a dramatic flaw in my algorithm, which is that when I show this to my grandmother, or if you show this to a patient with ALS, and you, and you ask them, hey, just move this robot to pick up that coffee mug, they're going to produce something that is incredibly shaky and unreliable. right? And so you kind of learn off of that. It's like what you want them to show is not how they're doing it now, but how they want to do it, right? What you want is how they want to do it, not how they're doing it, right? And that is like a maddeningly hard problem, right? Because if they knew how to do it, well, they would just do it. Uh, but so what you need to do is to actually keep the controller in the loop while you're learning their intentions. That creates, uh, marginalizing that control is like a non-trivial machine learning problem. Like that, that creates a confound, right? So because you don't know what the, whether they're moving because that's how they want to move it, or because that's how the controller is telling them to move it. But so in, in these situations where you're physically manipulating objects, though, there's a lot of uncertainty and this sort of stuff. But in the case of a, of a simple button where it's actually you know, government regulated to behave in a certain way, it mm -hmm. seems like there's a number of constraints which would allow. Uh, that's true. Although there may be uncertainty in its pose. Uh, right. So that, that's what I was asking about the camera system, right? So what would be sufficient you know, sensing to be able to say, like, they're all going to look roughly like this, they're all going to have this sort of lettering. So what do we need in order to be able to figure out the pose such that we can uh, you know, have a system like this do path planning to be able to you know, execute the final action, right? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the, a system like this needs two things. One is it needs a rough model of what the world looks like so that it doesn't bump into stuff. That doesn't have to be a beautiful, accurate model. It could be just a blocks world kind of rough model. And then it needs to know with somewhat greater precision where the thing is that it needs to pick up or, or it needs to press, right? Because that is actually important to get to. The rough model is okay because it just needs to avoid stuff. The precise model is important because it needs to pick up stuff. And so it needs, uh, I think with an RGBD camera um, in the wrist, we've been able to do perform actions like this. 
Um, and you can do that autonomously. You can do that with shared autonomy. Uh, knowing that you press the button or not is actually fairly non-trivial, right? Like if you can half press a button, you can three quarters press a button, but like to know that you have satisfiably pressed the button completely uh, requires some hybrid force position control. And or it could just be the operator says, "No, dummy, you didn't press the button." <laughs> so the robot can go and press harder, right? But that requires some some engineering. We've worked on a lot of uh, DARPA-like programs where they've asked us to press buttons of various kinds. And it's actually not an easy problem. <laughs> Knowing when you actually press the button is, is non-trivial. Uh, or press the drill, actually. We had a pro in the RMS problem. We had to pick up the drill and turn it on. And it's like, boy, if you don't have like hearing, it's really hard to tell whether you pick, you've turned the drill on or not. <laughs> the way you would do that is actually to start drilling and, and see if there was like something happened. And they're like, oh, I didn't turn it on. That was the problem. So yeah, it's a. Uh, You'd be surprised by the kinds of things that are hard when you have a robot. <laughs> like knowing when you've turned on a drill is actually pretty hard for a robot to figure out. Cool. So related, uh, this is a problem that I've been uh, working on lately, which is feeding. Um, yes, question. One question on the previous slide. So you mentioned about reversing the, uh, the model to get intentions and getting the uh, user to demonstrate how they would have done it if they were fully able. Uh, but since they cannot, it's a hard problem. Is it, uh, is it feasible to have them train, a, uh, train the robot in a virtual world? That's a good question. Um, possibly. Uh, I mean, that raises questions of like embodiment versus like non-embodiment. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that um, even in a virtual world, they're going to have a hard time moving it the way they want it to do, right? Because... Um, Unless you come up with some sort of very simplified controls for that. Um, I, think, I think more in terms of, like, if you're building systems for them that, uh, that allow them to control through abilities that they still have remaining, mm -hmm. then maybe you can exploit the same abilities that they still have remaining to build a software interface for them that allows them to train the robot in that virtual environment. And oh, will, uh, oh, just, that's, that's like a way more interesting thing than I was saying. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great idea. Huh. I, I never, uh, I, I've never actually worked with virtual worlds since I have real robots hanging around in my lab. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I mean, I think part of this is also like structuring the training methodology. Right? Like the algorithm is pretty robust, but like figuring out how to train is is, is not easy. But feeding, yes. Um, so uh, this has been one of the, the the newer problems I've been interested in quite a bit for two reasons. One is uh, every every a uh, patient that we've talked to had said that, you know, I'd love to have a robot that could actually, you know, enable me to eat a proper meal, right? Instead of being fed or eating sort of pre-cut meals. And so I would like to develop a system where you can just put food in front of a robot, spaghetti, chicken, whatever you want, and it can twirl the spaghetti or it can cut the chicken or it can, you know, pick up the sushi, do whatever it wants. From a technical point of view, this is actually a really fascinating problem because this is a deformable object manipulation problem. Uh, all the while now, I've told you that I love building models, and I like models, and I build simple models. But it's going to be really, really hard to build a model of how spaghetti moves when you twirl a fork in it. Right? So I think it really is going to compel us to think not just about model-based methods, but also model-free methods. This is sort of a proof of concept here. The robot is autonomously feeding. That's my PhD student, Laura. Uh, we have a, a RGBD sensor that's uh, looking at the scene from the top. And it's using a very, very simple classification algorithm to find grasp targets. This is like just a vanilla demonstration. This algorithm has a very interesting flaw in that it really prefers picking broccoli over chicken. And so <laughs> if you notice, all she's doing is eating broccoli, uh, which gets pretty tiring after you eat like the first 10 pieces of broccoli. That's but food. <laughs> Sorry? That's Asiana food. That is Asiana food, yes. That's food from the third floor uh, store uh, at Newell Simon Hall. But oh, I should, it just loves broccoli. Um, but the other interesting problem, which is actually a very interesting HRI problem, is that feeding is actually a handoff. It's a handoff from the fork to your mouth. Right? And actually, thinking about the timing of this is really important. Right? If you have a robot that just picks up and feeds you all the time, this is a little bit like you know, the Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times, where he's just desperately trying to not eat, whereas the robot is just constantly feeding him food over and over again. Right? There's this rhythm to feeding that is actually really, really important to understand. Uh, we eat when our mouth is not full, when we're not talking, all of those things. Right? 
And I'd like a robot to be able to be like a caregiver. So I have two young kids, and I, I feed them often. And there's a rhythm to feeding. You go and like, you just hold the fork threateningly in front of them with the broccoli in it. And then at some point, you shove it into their mouths. And at some points, you don't. So I think that when you watch caregivers feeding someone, it's not just this mechanical task of like every 10 seconds bringing some food to someone's mouth. There's actually a wonderful rhythm to it. This rhythm is actually quite exacerbated when you're, doing, when you're eating socially. So this is actually a social dining study that we conducted where we're using uh, face trackers to actually track people's faces as they're eating. So social dining is particularly interesting because how you eat depends not just on sort of when you want to eat, but also on your interaction. So we're doing, we're tracking sound, we're tracking people's faces, we're tracking people's expressions to try and understand the dynamics of social dining. Right? This is really, really interesting data because if I'm eating with you and I want you to not eat, as soon as you start bringing your sandwich to your mouth, if I just look at you, you're going to put the sandwich back down. So this, you can try this the next time we eat with someone. It's really awesome. Uh, so there's this like, really wonderful rhythm to show social dining that I'd like to be able to learn, and I'd like a robot to be able to be a part of. So a lot of interesting math in, in feeding, uh, both in terms of sort of picking up stuff and also in social dining. So to enable this, we built the world's most expensive fork. Uh, this is a six-axis force torque sensor, an ATI Nano 17, the same I used in my PhD, that we cut a fork in half and we stuck it in there. Because when you feed, or when you, when you pick up food, when you're cutting chicken, it's as much a proprioceptive force torque rich uh, data as it is of just motion and, and looking at perception. So we're collecting data here of, um, we, we're using mocap to track the position of the fork, the position and orientation of the fork, and also collecting six degrees of freedom for stark data of food as we're cutting it, such that we can do both bite classification, we can classify food based on how it feels, as well as run closed loop control algorithms that can actually cut your chicken the right way. And then when you feel the bone, you can cut around it. So it's a, it's a, it's a cool problem. So we have the, the four stark sensor actually embedded um, with our robot, so there's the little wire that comes out, we're getting data at 500 hertz, and we're closing the loop with control algorithms that can actually manipulate food. This is something that I'm super excited about. It's also a really nice data set that we hope to, hope to release soon, but I'd love to work on this too, with, if you guys are interested. So I wanna wrap up and say that sort of, I gave you sort of a, a brief tour of both manipulation and manipulation with and around people. Um, sort of the guiding concepts for me have always been trying to bring about this sort of reconciliation between what robots are really good at, which is solving search problems in simulation, and what they ought to be good at, which is understanding models of physics, actually dealing with the nitty gritty of the real world, as well as modeling humans. And I think there's a lot of parallels here. Um, I think humans are really, really good at understanding each other, acting seamlessly, acting in a way that understands trust and adaptability and all of these concepts. And I'm trying to find ways in which we can extract that and, and formalize it as sort of in, in terms of stochastic optimal control, treating a human as a rational agent who's sort of noisily optimizing a cost function. This has actually been, been quite, quite interesting for us. And overall, uh, I'm excited about manipulation. I wanna close with uh, one more thing, which is that we do a lot of tours. So if you have kids who are interested in coming to our lab, please bring them over. Um, this is actually a picture from one of the several tours that we did um, for, for high school kids and uh, elementary school kids in, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. But we'd love to, love, love to host people. It's, it's really great. It also, Robotics is a great way to sort of spread STEM education because it's a robot, it's cool, and, and then it, it uses science. And we get adorable letters that, 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 <laughs> that, uh, from, from people. Uh, this particular letter said that the, the thing that they liked the most about Herb was the bow tie that he wears, uh, nothing else. <laughs> but uh, that was great. So I'd like to thank my students and uh, thank you. We have time for questions. Yeah, yeah we have the room to three. So. Questions, comments, feeding. Is that a good, good thing? Okay. Yes. Uh, can you share uh, if you're doing anything else with your uh, ALS uh, user? Uh, what are what are the other areas you're working with? Like, is it just exclusive with this or? So, so we're we're looking mostly at uh, enabling them to pick up stuff. Um, the, in terms, in that particular regime, uh, one of the other aspects we are looking at is uh, planning with visibility constraints. 
So it turns out um, if you're planning with a robot and you're controlling it to actually pick up something, and if the robot occludes you, we as sort of able-bodied adults just do this. Right? We just sort of look around. Uh, but imagine someone who actually can't do that. Right? That's actually a very hard constraint for them to actually deal with the fact that there's limited visibility for their motion. So we're actually planning motions in such a way that are actually knowledgeable about sort of human visibility constraints and requirements. So, um, so our group started off, our group's called Enable. Uh, we started off uh, uh, our life as uh, a group to help, to, to basically build technologies for people with ALS. And uh, the first one we did was a, an eye gaze controlled wheelchair. Oh, I was going to say, I just started looking at eye gaze. Yeah, so, so that's, that's why we're tracker. asking the ADA access button is because uh, we can move pe people around the building, uh -huh. but we can't get through an ADA door, for example. So the idea of throwing an arm to be able to push the button to allow you to eye We can the totally door do that. Uh, is, I mean, especially, so I, I have a, um, a, a, gaze, a pupil lab's uh, eye tracker that I just got. Um, and, and that has both two inward pointing cameras and one outward pointing camera that well, sees the world. You just got it, right? uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just got that. Oh, uh, cool. So uh, we're working on Toby and we uh, integrated. Oh, Toby also. Okay. Yeah. That's the more expensive one. Uh, no, actually, Toby's, Toby's the, head, the head mounted one is more expensive. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, um, so we have a system for, so we focus initially on uh, mobility and communication. Uh, so for eye tracking wheelchair and uh, I guess control typing and speaking. Wow. Okay. Uh, and so we've, we've had some reasonable success in that. And, but the, the edge problems that we are trying to encounter are very quickly intersecting with the problems that you are trying to solve. And uh, so one thing we want to do is autonomous navigation, uh, basic sensor detection, basic uh, obstacle detection around, say, navigating around doors, uh, navigating through the doors, and things like that. Yeah. Hi, so, that, that sounds great. Actually, I was going to say a couple of things. One is that the... Uh, the two things that I'm really interested in using with like patients with, uh, with sort of high spinal cord injury or ALS are um, eye gaze and speech. Um, and, and I think those are two things that I don't use at all. I haven't shown you any of that. Um, and I think that they can provide both semantic information about the world as well as particular information about the, the task at hand. So one other thing is that, so one more sentence, which is, uh, I have been particularly interested in using natural gaze. So I actually just wrote a proposal about natural gaze. So a lot of gaze work, right, um, looks at gaze as a laser pointer, right? Essentially, it's a, I, I look at this object, I want to pick it up, right? But natural gaze, like the way we look at each other, the way we interact with each other, each other, has so much more information, right? There's smooth pursuits, there's saccades that we do, uh, and, and there's fixation points, and all of that tells us rich data not just about the world that we're looking at, the things that we consider important, but also other distractors, like how much trust we have in our system. When, our, when you stare at your robot as it's moving something, tells you a lot about how confident you are about this robot, right? And so we're trying to use natural gaze, and that sort of uh, gets suppressed if you force the users to use gaze as a laser pointer, right? And so one, one hypothesis we have is that like, if you allow a natural gaze, of course, it's much harder to model what they're actually looking at, but perhaps we can extract more latent state uh, from human interaction. Uh, so for the, uh, uh, for the control arm on the wheelchair, uh, have you had to do any modification of the wheelchair itself? No, it turns out, so, so, so the answer is yes and no. So Kinova does take care of all of that. So we actually have a, um, a, a, um, a base that uh, it could be just an off-the-shelf wheelchair base. The arm uh, comes with an API that, connect, that talks both to your computer as well as to the standard sort of Bluetooth controller that's on any powered wheelchair, right? And so and a representative from Kinova will show up at your doorstep and fix the arm on the base for you, right-handed, left-handed, uh, how high you want it to be, and they will integrate it with the base. And they have over 250 real users in Canada and in Europe. So they, they'll do this for every single person. So one of the things that would be interesting as a point of collaboration would be uh, uh, to have eye gaze plus a robotic arm. That would. Uh, and yeah. uh, we could build some interesting interfaces to have the, have the shared autonomy that you're talking about. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about that is that what we found with eye gaze, and especially eye gaze control for the wheelchair, is that Direct manipulation for some interfaces makes sense, but oftentimes you need a higher level concept because direct manipulation, we, we both tried the Canova 
joystick manually, and it's just yeah, it's, it's terrible. To, to God, yeah. Manipulations, and so and it's got all those buttons that you. So the Canova joystick is a study in poor. Oh my, am I being recorded? <laughs> okay, it's a, it's, it, it's a it's a study in interesting design. Uh, it's got this joystick, and you can move it X and Y, but you can also twist it, which you have to be like a ninja to twist it. And it has two tiny buttons on top that you need to press, and those buttons cycle through. Uh, like four choose two modes that are given by two LEDs. And so it's like you have to, like, if, if light one is on and light three is on, then it means something. If light one is on and light four is on, it means something else. And it's just the most, like, maddening interface in the universe. I mean, it does a lot, but it's clearly designed. You just through them until yeah, exactly. What I end up doing is I press a mode, I move, oh, that wasn't it. And I press something, oh, that wasn't it. And I just cycle through all of them until, oh, that's what I wanted to do. So how did you choose uh, feeding? Because like, like, so for the, for the patients that we deal with, by the time they're in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. uh, if you're diaphragmatic or, or vulvar onset, you have a very difficult time eating. And so you know, by that point, you're really close to having a feeding tube. And even for limb onset, by the time you're in a wheelchair, it's not that much time before you can no longer feed yourself like you know, chewable food. So, so we work with patients with high spinal cord injuries. So I think right. that, that, that I think the sense. larger population that we work with is through the Rehab Institute of okay. Chicago is high spinal cord injuries. So there, your, you know, yeah. your feeding is, is, is not affected as much. Yeah, that, that's fair. Okay. Um, I've also recently been talking to stroke survivors uh, mm -hmm. who are also an interesting uh, domain to you. So uh, the difference between stroke survivors and high spinal cord is interesting. Right? So high spinal cord injury, uh, you get injured and that's it, right? You're pretty much fixed, right, in terms of your capabilities. Stroke survivors, um, two things are different. One is, of course, cognitively they're slightly affected, right, whereas high spinal cord injury you're not as much. But it's a moving target. They actually get better, right? You get better. So there's a concept not just of assistance but also of rehabilitation that you can build in, which I think, again, is, like, super fascinating to me. Like, building mathematical models of rehabilitation is also really interesting. Like, how do you, when do you know when to let the person do it themselves? versus a system, in, a system in doing a task. Like, what is the sort of long-term reward that you have in mind? And so that's something that I'm really interested in targeting, too. So, so in, in terms of, uh, for patients with uh, um, uh, neck injuries and uh, spinal cord injuries, have you explored uh, speech as a form of control? Yes, yes and no. Um, so they actually, um, they have their own, several speech interfaces on their own. The challenges with speech are, um, if it's a closed world, then you know, speech works reasonably well. You know, your Siri or Echo or whatever else it actually works pretty well. The challenge is in like, coming up with um, like structuring the world, right? Like if you have an open world and the robot say, and the human says, like, you know, go, go to the left of this and open the door and do all of these things, that becomes very, very hard to, to translate. Um, so being able to translate from natural language to semantics requires the, wor the robot to actually understand semantics. Like, if the human says, go around the chair, the robot says, I, I don't know what a chair is. Like, I don't know where my chair is. Right? So I think in these sort of closed world dialogue-based settings of like, what's the weather like today? Uh, you know, that's very easy to understand and interpret. But semantic understanding of worlds requires you, requires, puts greater burden on the robot to understand semantics. Of course, you can put April tags, QR codes in parts of your world such that the robot knows that it's in the kitchen. You can have pre-built models. You can engineer things in a way that, that do certain things. The one thing that um, I think would be very, very useful speech modality is stop. <laughs> you know, if you say stop, the robot should stop. And that's something that's fairly universal, <laughs> I guess, in what the robot can do. Uh, but it's, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, Work though, where we put objects in a confusing situation, like there are two objects that are same shape but in a different slightly next to each other, and how people would describe that to this other person to disambiguate between these. If the, yes, yeah, so like if you have multiple chairs in the world, and if the person is trying to tell the robot that you should avoid this chair, what would be the natural description that comes out of the person? Yeah, so it's, it's a, for yeah, yeah, yeah. I can also be really useful. Yeah. I think the yeah I think the one thing we've run a couple of studies where we discovered that like humans are uh, you know if you give them open open worlds to to describe the descriptions are maddeningly rich right? it's just like it's it's incomprehensible sometimes even to other humans like we ran a Amazon mechanical truck study where we asked people tell us uh, how you describe this block to somebody else. And then we took that and we asked somebody else, tell us where the, what block is that people are describing. And they're like, I don't know. 
right? <laughs> it's just that it's, um, you know, we, are, we assume a lot of domain knowledge. Um, and the other interesting thing that would be really nice to look at, which a lot of NLP people don't look at, is dialogue. One of the nice things about having a robot is that you can actually talk back and forth, right? But dialogue is one of the like, hard problems in NLP that a lot of people are looking at. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that, would be, that would be great. We should talk more. Thank you. Thank you.